Hello film fans, and welcome to this episode of The Sherlockian. Now, December 29th, 2021, saw the release of Disney Plus's most successful Star Wars series so far, The Book of Boba Fett. Now, if you type in The Book of Boba Fett onto YouTube, it's a fair bet that you'll come up with a video saying something along the lines of Disney's most embarrassing Star Wars mistake so far, The Book of Boba Fett, and that kind of thing. And I think it's fair to say that the series had a critically mixed reception, as Wikipedia rather politely termed it. However, I don't like disliking things very much, so this video is going to look at the top five most positive things that came out of the series. Now, first of all, I should stress that this doesn't exonerate the series entirely from some of its mistakes. For example, the structure of it is quite messy. It spends way too long on some quite strange side stories, like for instance, did we really need half an episode on seeing a CGI Luke Skywalker train a baby Yoda? I mean, some people might have enjoyed it, but I personally found it a bit of a drag. The same goes for the trailer, which must rank as one of the worst trailers in the entire history of film on TV ever. It was so dull. But let's not get hung up on the bad stuff. So let's look at the five positive things that came out of the series. Now, the first good thing to come out of the Book of Boba Fett was Tamara Morrison's performance. I think even people that don't like the show very much had to agree that it was pretty outstanding. Considering that he's a middle-aged bloke, <laughs> his physical performance in particular was really outstanding. There was one scene early on, I think it's in the first episode, when he has a one-on-one -on -one duel essentially with a Tuscan Raider. I thought, oh, you can see a bit that he's, you know, an older man. He moved a bit like the way Robert De Niro moves in The Irishman. You know, despite the CGI de-aging effects, you can still tell that he's an old man playing a younger man. But you can actually pass that off as the fact that, you know, his character is actually, you know, he's been dragged through the desert and he's exhausted and, you know, he's not in a really fit state to fight anybody, let alone a younger person. And... I don't ever remember seeing that again in the series. Now that might partly be because he gets his armor back and therefore, you know, it's the stunt man doing quite a lot of the work, but actually he takes his um, helmet off quite a lot. So it clearly can't just have been that the stunt man was really good, though I'm sure he was. The other thing though that I didn't really expect was that Tamara Morrison was really good at the emotional part. Now he's a very credible actor, so it's not surprising that he was good, but it's not something that I've ever really associated with the Boba Fett character before. I mean, if you watch the original series, Boba Fett doesn't really say a lot, does he? I mean, he's quite stoic, never takes his helmet off, and he's quite quiet really. I mean, it's more his appearance that captured people's imaginations, not his performance, you know, on an emotional level. But I was surprised at how much this show really pulled at my heartstrings. I would think it's fair to say it's not quite Mandalorian levels of heart tugging, but it is quite emotional at some points. And although some of the emotional beats are a bit on the nose, like for instance, when Boba Fett comes back to find that all his Tusken Raider friends have been murdered, which I have to admit when I saw that for the first time, I did think, oh, come on, that's a bit on the nose, isn't it? But Morrison really sold it with his performance. He did genuinely look like a man who found it hard to process emotion, trying to process emotion, which is a really clever trick to do. So Morrison's performance on both an emotional and a physical level was absolutely fantastic. And certainly any problems with the show can't be blamed on him. It's more a problem with the pacing. Next on my list of stuff that was good is the aesthetic. Now, this is something that the Disney Plus Star Wars shows do really really well anyway. They really capture the aesthetic of the original Star Wars series and then build on it to create something new. And this is exactly what the Book of Boba Fett does. I really loved the way it was a pastiche of lots of different genres. I remember one of my um, lecturers at university saying rather disparagingly about Star Wars in general that basically when it no longer became politically correct to uh, stage um, those kinds of you know imperial dramas like Lives of a Bengal Lancer in the real world, people started to stage them in fantasy environments instead, like space, for example. And he said you could see that kind of very clear-cut goodies versus baddies in things like Star Wars. Now, I think that's a little bit unfair. It's certainly 
I think it's fair to say that Star Wars is not pro-imperialism. If anything, it's very anti-imperialism. But certainly you could see that kind of essence of that imperial kind of drama, like Lies of a Bengal Lancer or the uh, Four White Feathers in the early episodes in particular, like um, the first episode, I, I got a real sense of that where Boba Fett was being dragged through the desert by the Tusken Raiders. It really did feel like a film from the 1930s or 40s, or maybe a Western in the 60s. That said, it was a really nice pastiche, and certainly I, I didn't find it insulting or anything. Other pastiches as well, which were quite nice, were the mods and rockers aesthetic of the uh, different cyborgs that Boba Fett teams up with. I really like the way that their speeders look like scooters, which I thought was a really cool touch. They even got down the sort of mod trick of having multiple mirrors though they wisely didn't keep the mod trait of hanging knickers on the back of people's scooters because that would have looked a bit odd. And other things I particularly liked as well is Cad Bane's entrance, which we'll come to a bit later on because that was another really good thing I enjoyed. But his entrance really reminded me of Omar Sharif's entrance in Lawrence of Arabia when he comes out of the sort of the miasma of the desert and then kills someone. So there was those nice little pastiches which clearly showed the influences of other genres and other famous films but it didn't feel like it was simply copying those films it kind of felt like somebody had watched those films and thought oh that's a clever thing and then kind of worked it into the Star Wars aesthetic and put their own twist on it. So that was something I really enjoyed and it's very nicely shot and looks gorgeous and considering it was filmed you know during a time of you know global pandemic you can't possibly tell, it's brilliant. And after the first episode in particular, the CGI is absolutely flawless. But anyway, I really enjoyed the aesthetic and thought it was brilliant. Now, my second favourite episode of the entire series was the one that actually didn't feature Boba Fett at all and was all about Mandalorian and looking at how he's progressed since the end of the second series of The Mandalorian. And the bit I enjoyed most was weirdly the return of something that was intimated in the second series of The Mandalorian, but was never fully explored. The fact that Mando's cover of The Mandalorians are essentially a splinter group of Death Watch, which, as any Star Wars fan will be able to tell you, in The Clone Wars, Death Watch are a terrorist group, essentially, who take over Mandalore and turn it into a kind of military cult. Now I really enjoyed this because it fleshed out the Death Watch in a way that I don't think the Clone Wars really did. Now of course the Clone Wars was an animated series primarily designed for children so even though it did look at sort of the grey areas of things like wars and conflict they still did have to have clear-cut goodies and baddies to make it accessible. Now Death Watch I think were clearly intended to be baddies. I mean they are extremely ruthless and although they have cool armour and helmets and weapons, I don't think there was anybody who watched that scene when they destroyed that village in the episode where they're introduced, <laughs> who thought, oh no, I think they've got a point somewhere. I mean, I hope there wasn't anyone that thought that. They are shown as being very militaristic and very ruthless. And their leader, Kree Vizsla, is, you know, shown as being competent, very competent even, but not a nice bloke. And that's something that I really liked in the way they sort of fleshed out in this particular episode because in the Mandalorian season two we saw that Bo-Katan's version of the Mandalorian they're not particularly nice I mean they were willing to help Mando but they were shown as being slightly duplicitous and I mean I wouldn't put it past Bo-Katan to murder Mando if it meant she'd get her hands on the dark saber by contrast the Death Watch cult which he finds you know he finds the survivors of his previous coven I really like the way that they were shown as, even though they are this strange cult which won't remove their helmets, and although they eventually kick him out because he admits that someone has seen his face, I really like the fact that they were still shown as having honour, even more honour than these sort of mainstream Mandalorians. I particularly like the scene where a Vizsla's descendant challenges Mando to a duel, and it's all done very fairly and by the book. You know, this is a really stupid idea, there's only three of them left. I mean, what are they doing killing each other? which is kind of the downside of the Death Watch thing generally. But I really like the fact that even though it's a really stupid idea, it's all done very fairly. And you don't get the sense that Vizsla, even though he wanted the Dark Side really badly, was going to stab Mando in the back because that wouldn't be honourable. So it again kind of broadens, you know, these really strange militaristic thugs and broadens them out and shows that you know they are people under all that armor they're not just a bunch of terrorists 
And when they, you know, told Mando to leave, I did feel quite poor inside emotionally. I really understood why he looked so downcast. These are his family, the people that brought him up. And now he's got to leave and they don't want him anymore. It really did tug at the heartstrings. And it's one of the reasons why the episode was so good. But it also means that I'll watch, or when I re-watch The Clone Wars, I'll see the Death Watchers a little bit differently. I'll see them as, you know, actual real people rather than just, you know, cardboard cut-out baddies for you know, Obi-Wan Kenobi to go and slice in half with his lightsaber. And that's what I think these Disney Plus shows do really well. They broaden out the mythology of Star Wars and make it feel much more lived in and real, which only bodes well for the series as a whole. <laughs> Now, another thing that I really enjoyed about the Book of Boba Fett was the arrival of Cad Bane in live action. Now, Cad Bane has been one of my favourite characters in the Star Wars canon for ages, ever since I first watched The Clone Wars. I really like the idea of a bounty hunter that isn't honourable at all, that has really no sense of morality, or at least has a veneer of morality, but actually is just a ruthless psychopath underneath. It's such a nice twist on the idea of the Boba Fett type of character, which is that he's you know, hard but fair and he does have this kind of moral code that he sticks to. And of course it makes Cad Bane a perfect antagonist to Boba Fett because he's almost like a mirror image of Fett. It's like what Fett could potentially be or could potentially become if he'd give in to his darker instincts. Now I personally loved the aesthetic of the live action Bane. I thought he was brilliant. I know there were some people that didn't like it. They thought that he was, you know, too pale, and that his mouth was in the wrong place and his nose was a slight wrong shape. But I must admit, I thought he looked brilliant and absolutely repulsive. In particular, his mouth was amazing. Those really sharp, those needle sharp teeth just looked disgusting. And it gave him a kind of I don't know, bottom feeder element, you know those kind of fish that you get at the bottom of lakes and rivers and even those really strange creatures you get at the bottom of deep oceans like the Mariana Trench for example, it really gave him a horrible sense of something that's just you know, waiting to bite you. It was disgusting. But the best thing about the aesthetic course were his eyes. They were obviously bright red, which is, you know, quite noticeable. But even more than that are those a kind of intense stare they give off. It really reminded me of Lee Van Cleef, who played Angel Eyes in the classic Western The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. And I think this was deliberate. It was an intention to give that kind of aesthetic. And even the way he arrived out of the sort of miasma of the desert, which I've mentioned already. Obviously, I've said that it reminded me a bit of sort of Omar Sharif's arrival in Lawrence of Arabia, but that also is something that could potentially have been from a spaghetti western, and it is just amazing. I also like the fact that Bane was really unpleasant, which is always danger when you're looking at a villain who people like. I mean, essentially what happened to Boba Fett, Boba Fett was originally just a nasty bounty hunter that kidnapped Han Solo, took him to Darth Vader, and wanted money for him. But because people liked his aesthetic, and it is amazing, they then refurbished him, if you like, as this kind of you know, dark anti-hero. Someone that was unpleasant, but did have a code of conduct. And, you know, you see this in the Boba Fett series, as he gradually becomes more pleasant and more human, which I'll discuss a bit later. But with Bane, I love the fact that they've kept on to the idea that he is just a complete and utter jerk, that you know kills people for money and has absolutely no regrets about it whatsoever. And I also really like the idea that in their final duel, which is absolutely brilliant, and it's a really nice pastiche on the you know, classic Western duels, I really like the fact that despite the fact that Bane is older than Fett, he's still faster. It really adds to his mystique. It would have been a real anticlimax if Fett had just shot him straight away. Because after all, Fett is wearing Mandalorian armour, which does make him quite impregnable. But it also makes sense that Fett is better at hand-to-hand -hand combat, because after all, Bane's speciality during the Clone Wars was killing Jedi. And in the animated series, generally, he kept at sort of range, which you know, makes sense. You're not going to attack someone close up who has a lightsaber, are you? And then sort of snipe at them from there, often using things like his rocket boots or his flamethrower to give them an advantage. So it does make sense that Fett, who's trained with the Tusken Raiders for quite a long time, would be better at hand-to-hand. -hand. And so it made the duel seem quite real. It didn't make Cad Bane seem like a lightweight. 
but it also sort of added to Fett's image, if you like, the fact he's still able to outwit this veteran bounty hunter who has been shown to be extremely competent across the series as a whole. So my favourite part of the Book of Boba Fett as a whole was probably the relationship between Boba Fett and Fennec Shand. Now, it's quite rare in film generally to have a relationship between a man and a woman that is completely platonic, particularly if those people are sort of roughly the same age. I mean, I think Tamara Morrison is playing a character that is a bit older than Ming-Na Wen's, but they seem roughly compatible and, you know, it wouldn't seem weird if their relationship was romantic. But I really like the fact they just seem like good friends. But more than good friends, they seem like two lost souls that have kind of found each other while sort of floating through the world. I really like the way that it kind of shows that neither of them are really happy with the way their life has progressed so far, which I think might be one of the reasons why this show caused a little bit of a stir. It kind of took away the mystique somewhat from, you know, previous ideas of Boba Fett. Now, this is partly to do with the fact, I think, that the Mandalorian came first, and essentially the Mandalorian was designed to fill the need that the cancellation of the Boba Fett movie, after the sort of mediocre success of things like Solo, it was meant to sort of fill the gap that that left. But more than that, I think it actually takes a very interesting look at that kind of portrayal of a character in general, the idea of someone just moving through the world, making a living, and then moving on again. It really reminded me of an interview I once saw by Lee Child, who created the character Jack Reacher. And he talked about the reasons why Jack Reacher is this kind of nomadic wanderer. And he said in that interview that most people that live like that, they're generally they have some kind of problem, whether it's you know a personal problem, whether it's alcohol related or drug related or mental health related. They have some reason why they can't seem to settle down. The Reacher is you know a product of the army lifestyle, so he was brought up in army camps and he joins the military and now he's left the military he kind of you know has no close friends or relations and he's sort of you know just left to wander through as some veterans are but i like the idea that it kind of explores in the book of boba fett that that isn't an entirely satisfying way to live your life it might seem like romantic being a bounty hunter but actually if you actually lived your life like that it would be quite lonely and the fact that Boba Fett has finally had enough of this and just wants to settle down and to make the world a better place, even if that world is a quite small community on a little known planet in the middle of nowhere. I really quite like that. And yes, it does remove some of the mystique of his sort of previous kind of lifestyle, the idea of this wanderer and strange armour. But if you liked that, then you've still got the Mandalorian to watch. So I don't think it loses too much. But I just really like the idea that these two friends who've decided to change the world. And I really like the relationship as well. I think ming no Wen has some really great one lines, which are quite funny, and they really juxtapose quite well with Boba Fett, who is primarily a hands-on person. I wouldn't say he's particularly witty. He's just, you know, this stoic, brave warrior. Whereas Fennec Shand is a brave warrior, but she's also an intelligent one. And you get the sense that without her, Boba Fett wouldn't last very long. He's great at the practical stuff, like killing people and fighting, but he's less good at the politicking and creating allies. And indeed, when he tries to do that in the show, he's not entirely successful, at least not with people that he doesn't have a personal relationship with, like Black Chrysanthemum or uh, Mando, who already have those kind of ties of loyalty to him already. But no, all in all, I thought this show was pretty good. I would definitely rewatch it. It's not, I think it's fair to say, as quite as good as the... Disney Plus Star Wars shows that came before it, at least the live action ones at any rate. I'm not a massive fan of the Bad Batch, I have to say. But I really enjoyed it and I think there's plenty of things to recommend it. Whether you could watch this show without having first seen Star Wars generally and The Mandalorian, both series of it, in particular, I'm not sure. This is the kind of show really that you can only watch after having seen all the others that preceded it. But that said, it still has much to recommend it. And I think it's well worth a watch if you haven't seen it already. Anyway, that was the Sherlockian. Thanks for watching, film fans. And I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.